All right, hi everyone. Uh, this lecture is the second part of chapter 14, The Brain for Biology 241, winter 2019. So where we left off, we were talking about the corpora quadrigemina. Oops. So recall that these are reflex centers that coordinate reflexes that allow us to respond quickly to uh, auditory or visual stimuli. So these reflexes are unconscious uh, some examples of them include, for example, whipping your head around when you hear a noise behind you, or uh, the startle response when there's an unexpected sound. So moving on to other areas of the midbrain, let me get my thing out here. So the red nuclei control upper limb muscle tone, and they're actually called red because they appear red. So sometimes, um, let's get a different color here, this one. So the red nuclei are bilateral, so they're right here and right here. And uh, in early explorations of brain anatomy, what you did was took out the brain of a deceased person and sliced it up to observe different structures. So remember that a nucleus is cell bodies in CNS. So typically a nucleus is a cell body uh, population in the CNS that is surrounded by white matter. So you can only really observe those if you slice up the brain. So the reason for the name red nucleus is because when you slice the brain, the red nucleus appears reddish. Alrighty. The substantia nigra is also named for its color, but substantia nigra means black stuff. And this is because of the, pr the presence of a compound in substantia nigra, here it is, called neuromelanin. Neuromelanin is like regular melanin, but it exists in brain tissue instead of in the skin. So in the integumentary system, we talked about how melanin is a protectant, so it uh, absorbs radiation that would otherwise harm DNA, but obviously, the substantia nigra is deep in the brain, so it's not going to be able to perform that same function deep in the brain. So that begs the question, what does it do? Well, neuromelanin is in the same biosynthetic pathway. Let's write that down. As dopamine and melatonin and serotonin. So neuromelanin you can think of as being a precursor to a substance that you can use to make those uh, hormones and neurotransmitters. So one thing that the substantia nigra does is produces dopamine in particular, and it uses that dopamine to modulate the activity of a group of nuclei called the basal nuclei, and these are further up in the cerebrum. So the basal nuclei coordinate pattern motor activity along with the cerebellum. And degeneration of the substantia nigra, so if this goes away, you no longer get dopaminergic regulation of the basal nuclei, which results in uncontrolled movement. So the tremors of Parkinson's disease are derived from central nervous system issue not from peripheral nervous system issues. All right, let's trash all those and, oops. All right, reticular formation. So when I introduced the reticular formation previously, um, I mentioned that you can't really localize it to any one place because it ascends from the brainstem up all the way into the cerebrum, and that's true. So we're just kind of showing you some ascending and descending parts of it in this picture right here. Um, but you can't really see the whole shape of it. So it spans the midbrain medulla and the pons, so all three regions contain elements of the reticular formation. And it does a bunch of different stuff. So one thing it helps to do is regulate muscle tone, so control the resting state of partial contraction. Another thing it does is receives input from higher brain centers, um, so it can feed back on skeletal muscles. So that's one way that it regulates tone. It also contains, oops, 
It contains a, a system called the reticular activating system. So this is, again, not localizable to one place. Um, this system is involved in things like uh, alertness and attention, for example. So we abbreviate this the RAS. It's actually thought that some forms of narcolepsy might be related to failures or malformations of the reticular activating system. So let's talk more about the RAS. This helps the body and the brain maintain alertness and attentiveness. So this includes consciousness, so being up and aware of your surroundings, and also mental arousal, so uh, how activated or on is your brain at any given time. So one thing that it does to maintain this is it alerts the cerebral cortex, which remember these are the populations of cell bodies that live at the edge of the brain. It alerts these to incoming sensory signals. So for example, it'll say, hey, you're about to get some visual information, get ready for that. And also it responds to visual, auditory, and cutaneous stimuli. So it helps to shift your attention from one signal to another as they come up. All right, moving on to the diencephalon. That's up here. So the diencephalon includes the epithalamus the thalamus, the hypothalamus, oops, and that is th those are the three parts. So really it's reductive to say that it's just the diencephalon. It's really a lot more than that. Um, and each of these parts have their own specific jobs. So we're gonna look at each of those jobs in turn. Okay, so I'm actually gonna take this opportunity to do some uh, anatomy here because I just uh, got done with some sheep brain labs. Sorry, I'm picking colors. Uh, just got done with some sheep brain labs and students were very confused about the locations of things on the sheep brain. Now, granted, I know this is a picture of a human brain, but um, the sheep brain really isn't organized all that differently. So I want to be very clear about what some things are. So, This whole thing is the corpus callosum. So one thing that I'm noticing that students are doing is looking at the uh, pointer sticks, so like this thing right here, and thinking that that means that only this part is the corpus callosum and not the rest of this stuff. So just be aware that stuff has to be pointed at. You have to do that somehow. That doesn't mean that the structure being indicated is only what's right around the pointer. Oftentimes it's much larger. Okay, so that's the corpus callosum. The entrance to the lateral ventricle is often seen here. In this case, the entrance to the lateral ventricle is covered over by a membrane called the septum pellucidum. So the septum is literally a dividing membrane, which you can see. And the lateral ventricle is going to be behind this. And really only a portion of the lateral ventricle, because remember from ventricles, the lateral ones um, have many horns and they loop around deep into the cerebrum. All right, so this structure right here is the fornix. And if you go inferior to the fornix, you can see the anterior commissure. Back here, we've got the posterior commissure, and above that is the pineal gland. Now, see there's vasculature right here, forming a little streak, and at the end of that streak is the pineal gland. The epithalamus includes the choroid plexus right here and the pineal gland. So remember the choroid plexus, um, this is capillaries covered by ependymal cells. So it's important to remember what the quarry plexus means um, functionally as well as structurally. So structurally, it looks like a little shreddy network of capillaries. 
functionally it is a very important task and that task of course is producing cerebrospinal fluid. All right, so you're seeing the medial aspect of part of the thalamus right here. The rest of it's back in the brain. And I'll show you another picture of the thalamus in a little bit. And then the triangular region below that is the hypothalamus. You can find the hypothalamus right next to the optic chiasm. The infundibulum, which is the stalk of the pituitary, has been cut in this picture. I will draw in where the pituitary would be. There it is. Let's write a P in there. And then the mammillary body is this neural tissue just below the hypothalamus. Okay, so it's important to remember also that ventricles are, are spaces that are filled with fluid. So another thing I'm noticing is students are pointing at things that are tissues and saying, is this the ventricle? So that implies that those students haven't internalized the idea of the ventricle as a space rather than a thing made of neural tissue. So when you look at this picture, you are looking through and into the third ventricle. That drains into this area, which is the cerebral aqueduct or aqueduct of midbrain. And then this triangular space below that, between the pons and the cerebellum, that's the fourth ventricle. So just keep in mind that although the ventricle model uh, makes it look like the ventricles are made of tissue, those models are produced um, as though someone has injected plastic into the ventricles instead of fluid and then pulled the plastic mold out. So the ventricle models represent spaces in the brain, not physical structures. Okay, so moving on. The choroid plexus of the third ventricle I already pointed out, so it's right here. Let me get a laser pointer, there we go. This is cool. Okay, so the choroid plexus is right here. The pineal gland is posterior to it, and this secretes the hormone melatonin. So melatonin is produced and secreted during the darkness, and it influences the day-night cycles of the body. So during the daytime, pineal gland makes serotonin. During the nighttime, pineal gland makes melatonin. And it specifically responds best to blue light. So light in the blue part of the spectrum inhibits the secretion of melatonin, and that's because when it's daytime out, the sky is blue, and most of the average spectra that you see from daytime light is bluish. So that inhibits the secretion of melatonin and tricks your body into thinking it's daytime, um, either because it actually is daytime or because you are laying in your bed looking at your phone screen, and surprise, surprise, the color shift of phone screens is bluish. So if you are having trouble sleeping, consider keeping your phone and other screened devices away from your bed um, so that you don't confuse your nervous system into thinking that it is the daytime. Melatonin also acts on other parts of the brain to regulate reproductive functions, but we don't really have time to go into that much here. However, um, melatonin's influence on reproduction was the core of my entire graduate work, so if you happen to find yourself like curious about that, feel free to ask me outside of class. Can I just... Hmm. Nope. Sorry. My computer has decided it doesn't want me to be able to turn the page anymore. All right, so there we go. Here's the thalamus. Maybe if I click pen and then go to arrow. Well, we'll see. It's glitching out on me. Okay, so here we have the thalamus, which is right there. Oops, now it's working, of course. All right, so here we have the thalamus. It sits on top of the midbrain and the brainstem. 
what's right here. And really this is only one half of the thalamus. So if you were to look at the brainstem um, from the anterior view, so if you were to turn this around, what you would see would look more like this. Oh, let's get black. So you would see two egg-shaped structures that were paired with this little middle bit being the massa intermedia. So you're only seeing half of it here and only seeing half of it down here. So keeping three-dimensional anatomy uh, in mind as you study this stuff is important because the models are of course 3D even though the pictures are not. And I can put stickers on either things for the lab practical. So um, understanding the thalamus in multiple contexts will best serve you for identifying it. Okay, so let's talk about the functions of the thalamus. Uh, its primary goal or job is to basically take incoming sensory information and direct it to where on the cortex it's supposed to go. So visual information goes to the eye area, auditory information goes to the ear area, those kinds of things. So for that, we say that its function is integrates sensations. And also this is a really good function for you to state for it if you are asked on the lab practical. Why? Well, it's short and sweet and true. That's perfect. So integrate sensations is a great one for that. It also has some role in filtration. So not everything that is sensed makes it to the cerebral cortex. And that's in part because not all signals that you receive are important to pay attention to. So for example, when you put on your socks in the morning, you're going to feel like you're wearing socks, but then shortly after, you just forget about your socks because it's not really important to walk around on the earth being like, I am wearing socks, I am wearing socks, socks are on my feet. Not an important signal. Way more important to say not step out into traffic, right? So some sensations are filtered out. It then projects or relays the sensations to the cerebral cortex, specifically to the part of the cortex that is appropriate for that signal. It also helps to connect emotional regions of the hypothalamus to the frontal cortex, which helps us to provide awareness of emotions. So not, our, not only are we feeling emotions, specifically the basal emotions of the hypothalamus, but also we're able to cogitate and think about and make sense of them. So not only can you feel, for example, angry, you can also send the anger signal to your frontal lobe and compute why you are angry. It also has a role in somatic motor control, so it helps coordinate between the basal nuclei and the frontal cortex, as well as coordinate between the substantia nigra and the basal nuclei. So all of those places are interconnected. Okay, hypothalamus. This is going to be monitoring sensory info from the CNS, and you might be saying to yourself, but Christina, there aren't any pain receptors in the brain. What sensory info? Well, not pain but rather uh, mostly chemoreceptors that are detecting changes in the cerebrospinal fluid and interstitial fluid. And that's important because CSF is bathing your neural tissue and your neural tissue is very valuable. So you wanna be constantly monitoring its chemistry to make sure it's not too acidic, not too salty, um, has the appropriate concentrations of ions, those kinds of things. Similarly, the chemistry of the blood is also monitored here. Um, because the hypothalamus has robust access to the blood supply due to its role in the endocrine system. So notice there are a lot, a lot, a lot of nuclei in the hypothalamus. Well, the pituitary gland is not a hypothal hypothalamic nucleus, but you get the idea. So I don't expect you to memorize all of these. There's too many of them and their functions are too varied and too specific. Um, so don't try to memorize all of this stuff. I'm more concerned with you memorizing the overall function of the hypothalamus, which includes these two bullet points and others. So let's continue to talk about it. One role it has is in the control of skeletal muscle activity, specifically subconscious control involving uh, somatic motor patterns 
and specifically motor patterns associated with pleasure, pain, sexual activity, and rage. So what do those have in common? Basal emotions. And basal behaviors. So aggression and sexual activity um, are observable in lots and lots of taxa in addition to humans. And they're considered basal because they are ancestral. So they're a set of behaviors and feelings that uh, vertebrates have in common. So it's likely that they evolved very early because they were adaptive. So sexual activity is adaptive because it promotes the transmission of genetic information. And aggression can be adaptive either from a protective perspective or in competition for territory and resources. So the hypothalamic control of that is pretty old. It also controls some autonomic functions. So there's heart rate, blood pressure, respiration, and digestion. And of course, it's not the sole controller of these things, but it is involved in their control. It also coordinates the nervous and endocrine systems uh, by secreting regulatory hormones. So you'll learn more about this in 242, but the basic idea is it secretes hormones from up here, and those hormones, and I'm using general up here, so all of this, so those hormones are going to act on the pituitary to cause the pituitary to release its own hormones. So between the hypothalamus and the pituitary, those are sort of the master glands of the body. All right, even more functions. It controls production of certain behavioral drives, for example, so subconscious changes in behavior. Um, so examples of this are feeding and thirst behavior. Specifically, the thirst one, because uh, your thirst centers are located in your hypothalamus, so they are going to control whether or not you feel thirsty and your motivation or drive to drink water. They also provide a link between voluntary and autonomic functions. So for example, think of a time when you were really angry or maybe saw someone you had a crush on. I bet your chest felt different for a little bit, probably due to a transient increase in heart rate, right? So that's a link between emotions and autonomic function. The hypothalamus computes that. So the hypothalamus has a really large role in that mind-body connection that links your physicality to the thoughts and feelings you're experiencing. Hypothalamus also regulates body temperature. So when it's time for you to have a fever, hypothalamus uh, turns up the thermostat. So causes fever response and ends it. It also controls circadian rhythms along with the pineal gland. So it receives input from the retina. So most of the optic tracts project back to the thalamus and from the thalamus back to the occipital lobe, and that's for processing vision. But a small number of those fibers don't project to the thalamus, but rather project back to the hypothalamus. So we call these the retino hypothalamic tract. And this is not for seeing, but rather for resetting a little tiny molecular clock that lives in your hypothalamus. So that clock produces specific gene products at specific kinds of times of day, and it resets according to what part of the day is light and what part of the day is dark. So as long as it's light out, the retinohypothalamic tract is going to send information to it, and when it's dark, it doesn't anymore. So that's how you sort of compute things like time of day, time of year, etc. All right, more hypothalamus functions. The mammillary bodies, so let me direct your attention to those. There they are. These process sensory information, including olfaction, and that controls feeding reflexes. So um, our feeding reflexes 
our primary one as adults is swallowing. So you can initiate swallowing, but the series of muscular events that happens after you initiate swallowing, that stuff is reflexive. So you can't, once you initiate a swallow, you can't control the rest of it. So um, for example, parts of the pharyngeal phase and beyond, you don't have control over. So the mammillary body is gonna coordinate that and also things like chewing and licking, etc. And it makes sense that they would control feeding behaviors because ancestrally feeding and olfaction are linked. So you use your nose to determine is food safe to eat? Is food yummy? So you can assess what kind of macromolecules might be in food by smelling it. So if it smells sweet, there's probably lots of carbohydrates in there. If it smells savory, that's probably a lot of amino acids. So the link between olfaction and feeding is really robust observably. And one of the reasons for that is the mammillary body. Okay, limbic system. So the limbic system is a really complex series of tracts and nuclei that are deep, deep, deep within the cerebrum. And these areas are really complicated and also, you know, still not 100% understood. So there are people, neuroscientists out there that study the limbic system for a living and they spent their entire careers on it because it's, it's quite complicated. So um, we're gonna kind of do a fly overview of the limbic system and I'll give you general information about what it as a group does. So it contains nuclei and tracts. So for example, here's a nucleus, here's another. These are connected via tracts here and here. So that's just a few examples. So in the base of the cerebrum, deep, deep inside. So your limbic system is also sometimes called your lizard brain, although that's not really a fair designation. I think your hypothalamus deserves that more. But your limbic system is responsible for doing things like coordinating emotions, forming memories, those kinds of things. So it links conscious cortex and unconscious autonomic functions of brainstem. It's also the center of motivation. So let's see if I can spell thing, haha. -ha. So remember, think about a time when you were like sitting on the couch or lazily sitting around and you were trying to work up the motivation to begin a task, say studying for this class. Um, parts of your limbic system are involved in getting you from having that thought to actually executing it. So that's what I mean when I say do the thing and motivational center. It's also the center for emotional states, drives and related behaviors. So for example, the amygdala is strongly involved in aversive behaviors and emotions like fear and anger. Via the hippocampus, it also provides memory storage and memory retrieval. And it links emotions to memories as well. And this is an interesting one in particular because if you look closely, you'll see the mammillary body, which we know is involved in olfaction, is linked via tracts both to the hypothalamus and to the hippocampus. So if you reflect on your life, you might find that, hey, certain smells have really strong memory associations. So like for me, if I smell burnt toast and like old linoleum um, and coffee, that smells like my grandma's kitchen and I think about my grandma instantly if I get those combinations of smells. Um, so the reason that there's such a robust connection between olfaction and uh, memory is because of these connections in the limbic system, but also because it's adaptive. So remembering odors is adaptive because our ancestors walked around outside unprotected. And so smelling things helps provide valuable cues of when you should run away or when you should hide, right? Because for example, um, 
say you're an early hominid and you're going to go to the place where your village goes to the bathroom. So you're going to go to a place in the forest and maybe uh, use the outside restroom. And on your way there, you smell something weird. You're like, oh, it smells musky. That's strange. And then on your way back, you smell the same thing again near the same tree. And then you look up and there is a leopard in the tree that is about to try to eat you. So if that's your first encounter with that smell, you're going to say, oh crap, it's a leopard and run away. And if you survive to live another day, the next time you smell that smell, you're not even going to have to look at the leopard. You'll just remember, oh, that's what the death thing smells like. I better run right now. So um, having a strong link between olfaction and memory is really adaptive. Um, but in modern society, it just has pleasant outcomes like remembering your grandma. Okay, so the cerebrum. Let me outline it for you. So this is the cerebrum. And then let me outline also the lobes. So we have the frontal lobe. And then we have the temporal lobe. the parietal lobe and the occipital lobe. So that's how it's divided up. And you have two of each of these, one on each side, one in each cerebral hemisphere. So broad sense, the cerebrum is responsible for processing sensory and motor information. And which it's going to do is going to depend on where on the cortex uh, you are. So we'll go through each area of the cortex piece by piece. It also provides conscious thought, specifically here. So your frontal lobe has the prefrontal cortex, which is where most higher cognition occurs, and thereby allows you to perform intellectual functions like thinking, knowing your social status, uh, deciding who you like or don't like, those kinds of things. OK, so here we have the cerebral cortex. And this is the outer covering of the cerebrum. So uh, there's a slide in a little bit later that I'll show you a section of the brain that's coronally sectioned. So it's sectioned like this. Um, and I'll show you a little bit more about the cortex then. So it's convoluted, meaning wrinkled. And it contains millions upon millions of neurons. So a lot, a lot, a lot of neurons. Not as many as the cerebellum, which actually has more, but still quite a few. So the cortex has three functional areas. These are three overall. So categories of areas rather than specific areas. So we'll go through them. But these are sensory areas, motor areas, and association areas. So afferent, efferent, and processing of information is their sort of general function. OK, so the lobes of the cerebrum are as follows. I showed you the frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal lobes. You can see those again up here. So frontal is anterior, parietal is superior and in the middle, caudal to that is the occipital lobe, and laterally there is the temporal lobe, which is right near your temple and your ear. There's also something that I like to call the secrets lobe, and that is of course the insula, which you can see right here. So the insula can only be observed if you take retractors and pull apart the frontal from the temporal lobe. So it's deep in the brain. So points to keep in mind are as follows. Um, the contralateral aspect of sensation and motor output. So remember, due to decusation, which is the crossing of fiber tracts from one side to the other, um, that means that sensory information that is coming in from the right side is going to be processed on the left and vice versa, and motor information that is descending from the left side is going to cross over to the right and vice versa. Also, 
Um, there are some cases, they're not very common, but they do exist, where the hemispheres differ a little bit in function. So for example, speech and language centers are usually on the left hemisphere, not on the right. Not always, but often. Okay, so this is that uh, picture I wanted to illustrate because this is another thing that students have been having a hard time with and I understand why. So in your book, it just has a side view of an intact, not sectioned brain. And then there's an arrow going to the cerebrum and it says cerebral cortex. And you're like, okay, so it must be right there. What they're not telling you is that the cere cerebral cortex is really the outer like three millimeters or so of gray matter that covers the all of the gyri. So it's just this outermost layer. Inside is white matter, and these contain tracts. So the gray matter consists of the cortex, which is cell bodies that line the outside, and also nuclei. And these nuclei are cell bodies surrounded by white matter that are deep in the brain. You can also see the corpus callosum. Here is the third ventricle. That little connector piece is the massa intermedia, and that makes this the thalamus and this the thalamus. So just to give you some frontal brain anatomy. Additionally, you can see ascending and descending tracts running both to and from the central nervous system and down through the pons and the medulla oblongata. Okay, so the white matter of the cerebrum takes a couple different forms and that depends on what processing needs to occur. So association fibers transmit impulses between gyri in the same hemisphere. So let's get my pen here. So this is a gyrus. So the gyri are the wrinkles. And the gyri contain the cerebral cortex cell bodies that do all the processing. So let's say gyrus A has something to tell gyrus B. It will use these arcuate association fibers to communicate that to its neighboring gyrus. So arcuate fibers go from one neighboring gyrus to another. There's also commissural fibers, and these are the fibers that form the commissures. So they transmit impulses between left and right hemispheres. So one example of a structure that's made out of commissural fibers is the corpus callosum. Another structure that's made out of commissural fibers is the anterior commissure. Not pictured here, of course, is the posterior commissure. Projection fibers form ascending and descending tracts, and those can be seen here. So these are going to contain tracts that have either afferent information or efferent information. So they're capable of transmitting impulses from and to the brain and spinal cord. All right, basal nuclei. These are part of the gray matter of the cerebrum, specifically nuclei of the cerebrum. That's why they're called the basal nuclei. And there's a lot of different ones. So we've got the caudatum, the putamen, the caudate nucleus, uh, the globus pallidus, the amygdaloid body is actually part of the um, limbic system, but it's still pictured here. So these are populations of cells that receive input from both sensory and motor pathways, as well as association areas, and send information to the prefrontal cortex, but also importantly, the premotor cortex and the motor cortex itself. So this is their role in movement. So basal nuclei function to do a bunch of different things related to movement. 
One is issue unconscious motor commands. So commands that you're not in conscious control of. Um, take, for example, micro adjustments of your postural muscles to keep you upright. So um, one thing that the basal nuclei participate in is that they also adjust muscle tone to set limb position. So they help you get your limbs into the position that you desire. And they help to provide coordination of learned movement patterns along with the cerebellum. So not initiation of them, but continuation of them. So especially your trunk and proximal limbs. And this helps you to do things like swing your arms and legs while you walk or throw an object or any practice movement. So this could include playing the violin, uh, going up for a layup in basketball, playing the piano, drawing, all kinds of things that are learned movement. Basal nuclei are involved in memorizing those and maintaining large patterned movements. Okay, so I mentioned that there were sensory, motor, and association areas in general, but that there were many kinds of those with many different functions. So let's start talking about those. All right, so let's talk about sensory and motor areas specifically. So we're gonna start with the primary motor cortex, and this is sulcus. on the precentral gyrus. So the reason that the central sulcus gets its uh, name, unlike other sulci, which don't have names, uh, is because it divides two important regions from each other. So we have the precentral gyrus in red, and the post-central gyrus in blue here. So the pre-central gyrus, let's release that for now, contains the primary motor cortex. And remember, cortex means edge tissue. So stuff that's deep to that is not um, motor cell bodies, but rather association tracts and descending tracts. So this is gonna control voluntary movement via somatic motor neurons and specifically the commands to move initiate in pyramidal cells. So these are specialized neurons that are named because they resemble triangles. So that's the kind of cell, the kind of neuron specifically that lives here. So the primary somatosensory cortex is here, and it also has a map of your body. But instead of having a motor map, so like maybe this area controls hand muscles and this area controls arm muscles, um, the primary somatosensory cortex contains a map that is sensory. So information uh, coming from your hands, for example, is going to be directed to the hand area of the cortex. So this is the ultimate destination of somatic sensory information. So remember, somatic sensory is not special sensory. Somatic sensory concerns these sensations. Things like vision and hearing are considered special because they have different organs. We'll talk about those later. So the sensation arrival at the cortex depends on thalamic delay. So remember, all sensory information that is incoming has to pass through the thalamus. So there's a slight delay in the sensation reaching the postcentral gyrus and the map of your body that's on there. So an example of when you might have actually experienced this but not known it is, um, have you ever cut yourself with a knife so sharp that you notice that you're cut yourself and then it takes a second before it actually hurts? So you look at your bleeding hand and you're like, oh dang, I cut myself, and then it begins to hurt. That brief delay uh, is related to thalamic delay specifically. Alrighty, so other regions of the cortex include the visual cortex, which is in the occipital lobe, so that's back here, and only the very back tip, because this area is the association area. This is the actual primary cortex, so the first place that visual information goes. Then we have the auditory cortex. That's, of course, on the temporal lobe. And that makes sense, right? Because this is right near where your ear is. And we know that the vestibulocochlear nerve um, comes from the temporal 
bone, because the temporal bone is what houses your auditory and balancing apparatus. And the olfactory cortex, which is also on the temporal lobe, but medial aspect of temporal lobe. So looking uh, at the temporal lobe from the medial side rather than from the lateral side. So it's, it's in here. The gustatory, so taste cortex, gustation is tasting. This is in the insula and on the bottom of the frontal lobe, so it actually has two places where it's processed. So the association areas of the cortex are these lighter colored regions that are next to the primary area. So primary areas are in darker colors, association areas are in lighter colors. So these are located in most lobes. So let's talk generally about what they do. So when the incoming data from whatever sensory modality is being experienced, so let's say for example vision, comes in, it goes to the primary cortex first. So in the case of the vision example that I'm choosing to use, the primary visual cortex back there. But it's not good enough just to say, oh, vision is happening. You have to do things like determine how far away from you the object is, ascertain its color, look at what shape it is. Does it have obvious edges or fuzzy edges? What texture is it? What does that object mean? So interpreting visual stimuli or auditory stimuli or other stimuli is actually a lot more complicated than you might think because we take that for granted most of the time. So the association areas of the cortex are critical for those functions, so allowing you to do something with the information that you're receiving. Oops, I'm going to go back. And in some cases, these may coordinate a motor response if one is required. So let's say you see an incoming object and it appears to be getting larger, which you know that means it's getting closer. Um, so that might cause you to do something like duck to avoid thrown objects. That's one example. There are many. All right, so the somatic sensory association area monitors primary sensory cortex activity. So um, what sensations are happening? So it's not good enough just to say, oh, like let's say this is the hand region right here that I'm circling with my little, um, let's get the laser pointer out. So let's say that this is the hand region right here. It's not good enough, it's not information rich enough just to say, oh, a sensation is occurring in my hand. Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it painful? Is it pleasant? Is it vibrating? Is it not vibrating? Is it pressure? There's lots and lots of different kinds of touch. So not only is it important to associate sensory information um, with a specific body area, but you also have to use the association area to determine things like, well, what kind of touch is it? So that's what it means when it says integrates and interprets sensations. All right, visual association area. Visual association area is right here, and that's from the example I already used. So this is going to monitor cortical activity in the primary visual cortex. Nope, it's doing that problem again. Sorry, guys. There we go. And it's essential for recognition of visual stimuli. So the steps involved in recognizing stuff include identifying uh, specific kinds of visual information like those I mentioned previously. So color, shape, distance, size, those kinds of things. So the recognition of that is done by the visual association area, not by the primary visual cortex. Same idea with the auditory association area, so that's on your temporal lobe. Um, so the primary auditory area is right here, and the association area is right here. So this monitors the activity of the auditory cortex and it performs the same function. So yes, sound is happening, but is it loud? Is it quiet? Does it sound like speech? Is it pleasant to listen to? Is it grating? Is it uh, rhythmic? Those kinds of things are all computed by this auditory association area. It also has some specializations that allow you to deduce things like speech, music, that kind of stuff. So with uh, respect to speech, there's some specific areas that are important to understand. 
So word recognition is one aspect of this. So after we talk about the premotor cortex, we'll talk about some specifics of those speech areas. So the premotor cortex coordinates learned movements. So this helps you generate what we call a mo motor program. And a motor program is basically the series of muscular contractions in order that you must do to produce the desired movement because most movements require that not only you contract your skeletal muscles, but also you don't contract them all at once. You do them in a sequence that produces the movement you want, and that's complicated. So that program is compiled right up here. So this sends impulses to the primary motor cortex in the form of the motor program. So movement is compiled here. The appropriate signals are sent to the appropriate areas on the premotor cortex, and that's where the descending signal initiates from. We'll see more about motor control when we get to pathways. Oops. It also stores patterns of movement, so it's another area where you can store up learned movements. And it generates impulses for sequential motor activities, so writing words or picking something up, something that has to require a series of muscular steps. We've also got the frontal eye field area, which has a very uninspired name, but it is very important. So this is in the premotor cortex, and it help can, helps to control learned movements of the eyes specifically. So you've probably been noticing as you've been studying the cranial nerves that there's a lot of cranial nerves and a lot of brain power dedicated to your eyes. Here's another example of that. So there's a whole entire area that's only for learned movements about eyes. So the back and forth motion your eyes make while you're scanning or driving, those kinds of things. All right, integrative centers. So specifically, these are places that receive info from many association areas. And then using that info, direct complex motor activity. They can also perform complex intellectual functions. And they include three major parts. So there's the general interpretive area, the speech center, which is associated with the auditory association area, and the prefrontal cortex. So I'm going to end this presentation by talking to you about the speech center, and then in the next one we'll talk about the other ones. So the general interpretive area is indicated in this picture, and it's also called Wernicke's area or the Gnostic area. And this is actually considered to be related to speech because the Wernicke's area is responsible for um, processing and understanding words. So it's usually in the left hemisphere, although not always, so there are rare cases where it's found elsewhere. And it receives sensory input from all association areas. It also is robustly connected to place where auditory and visual memories are stored, and it's capable of performing analysis of, of them. So this allows to a common thought to be formed based on sensory input, visual memories, and auditory memories. So if you think about speech, Let's take a really, really simple word, like an apple. So let's say it's a green apple. There is no intrinsic information other than photons in the visual signal of apple, right? So light bounces off the apple. The light happens to be in the green wavelength zone. It hits your eyes, and then that information gets sent back to your primary visual uh, cortex and your visual association area. So visual association area is going to do things like, oh, it's green. Oh, it's shiny. Oh, it's round. Oh, it has a stem. And then a memory of that thing is going to allow you to arrive at the idea that the thing you're looking at is apple-y. It has appleness. But to come up with the word apple, you have to send that apple to the Wernicke's area which computes the actual thought of Apple. So there's a lot of different steps to processing information and turning it into a word in the form of communication. So in class, I showed, and I will show anybody who missed it, uh, two videos. One of them is someone who's suffered a stroke and their Wernicke's area has been damaged. That man's name is Byron. 
So Wernicke's aphasia is the speech alteration that happens when Wernicke's area is damaged. Broca's area is the motor speech area. So in addition to having to come up with a word based on uh, auditory and visual and other signals, you also need to be able to move your mouth and your breath in a way that makes sounds that mean that word. And that's the goal of Broca's area. So again, this is usually in the left hemisphere. And this passes impulses to the motor area to control breathing during speech. So you have to modulate your breath pattern when you're talking because you still have to breathe in and out while you're speaking. But primarily, talking involves breathing out only. So you're changing your breath depending on what you're talking about, how fast your syntax, etc. And also, of course, the muscles of speech. Those are going to be the muscles of your palate, uh, your lips, cheeks, tongue, and pharynx, as well as a bunch of other ones. So here is a sort of laundry list of muscles used for speech. So to sort of drive this home, point home and to give you one last example before I sign off is think about a really, really simple sound. So a sound like t, that's the sound that t makes. In order to make that sound, you have to put the tip of your tongue on the part of your hard palate that is right behind your incisors. And then you have to store up a little bit of air pressure behind your tongue before you release it by letting your tongue not touch the roof of your mouth. So try saying it with me. T. T. You can feel those steps happening each time you pronounce that consonant, and that's an aspirated sound because you're pushing air out in a particular way, past a particular mouth shape. So the motor patterns to make that sound are found in Broca's area. So if Broca's area gets damaged due to a stroke, instead of having uh, Wernicke's aphasia type symptoms, which is things like uh, garbled or nonsensical speech, People with Broca's aphasia, and I'll show you a video of someone in, la in class uh, who has this, um, they know what they want to say perfectly well, they just can't make the motor commands to do it, which is very frustrating. So um, I will show those videos in class for the 730 students who missed them, and for everybody else, you've already seen them, so I will see you tomorrow on Thursday. Thanks for your attention, and have a good night.